Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. We keep track of all the banking terrorists and rapists. Hey, let's talk to Stacey Herbert. Stacey, what's going on? Max Kaiser, the first headline actually has you in it. <laughs> Silver bug goes viral with marketing war. Max Kaiser has become a fringe media star thanks to the web. Well, guerrilla. They go on to talk about the guerrilla warfare. You know, that's why America lost Vietnam, isn't it? Because of the fringe Viet Cong. Well, they're talking about the crash J.P. Morgan by Silver campaign. And it, it's interesting that this campaign has gone viral because you're not only saying, like, protect yourself against inflation and the fiat currency wars that are going on against the population, but it's a way to end market manipulation and the corrupt system that we have. As the article points out, for every dollar you take out of the physical universe of silver, you impact or impart $100 of liability onto the balance sheet of financial terrorist and rapist number one, J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon. Well, let's look at what has happened in the mainstream media, what's going viral in the mainstream media, Max. Yeah. So here is from CNBC, the biggest, uh, m most mainstream of the financial news networks. Wall Street baffled by slowing economy, low yields, trader. So this is CNBC, and they're interviewing Peter Yastrow, who is a market strategist. And he says, traders are panicked. They think there's a great, great depression. But listen to what he it, how he summarizes what is happening. And all the Fed tweaking and all the interest rate tweaking and all of the tax adjustments are actually not going to be able to save us if we cannot get across the labor that's in line with the rest of the planet and we can't get our productivity levels high enough to justify the wages we're already getting paid. Yes, the key phrase there, isn't it? He says that we need to get global wages in sync. Basically. That's right. That's right. So he wants American wages to come down to four thousand, five thousand dollars a year, about where Chinese wages are now. That's right. That's the whole goal of the global banking system. And this is the whole goal of Obama and the Obama administration is to facilitate global bankers to put in place a system where global wages are at parity so that the U.S. average income is something like 40000 that has to get down to 4000 that has to drop 90% before there's any kind of symmetry in the global banking system. And, of course, they want to seek uh, parity in all the gl global banking laws and regulations as well to make things like high-frequency trading, which Goldman Sachs does on Wall Street to steal $100 million a day, uh, more available to their partners in various locations around the world. Yes, but Max, this, is, this guy is a banker. He's speaking to bankers on CNBC. He's being interviewed by fellow bankers on CNBC. And note his contempt for, look what Ben Bernanke is doing to help us. He's cutting rates. He's keeping down rates. Thanks to Ben Bernanke, he says earlier in the interview. But he is not Houdini. It's those peasants, those people who are taking too much wages. Even though real wages have declined for the past 30 30 years in America, matched by a rise in real debt by Americans who cannot afford to live. But also, productivity gains in America have been massive over the last 30 years. And who has scooped that out? None of it has gone back to labor. It has all gone to these very same people, like Peter Yastrow and all of those other bankers on the floor of the stock exchange, scooping out all of the wealth with their high-frequency trading machines. Yeah, they, they blame the peasants. They blame the peasants, And yes. this is wherever in the world you see an occupying aristocracy, you see the aristocracy blaming the peasants, whether they're blaming the Greeks. Uh, for example, oh, they, those shifty Greeks don't pay their taxes. This is, you see, the occupying bankers blaming the peasants. Or you see it, of course, throughout history, whenever you've got a strong oligarchy in place, that, of course, they always blame the peasants. In this case, the American peasants are being blamed uh, for the American malaise by the banking occupation. Well, look at this headline from the other side of the Atlantic, from London. Forget entrepreneurs. Only banks can create wealth. This is an editorial from Deborah Orr, who is quoted as being one of Britain's leading social and political commentators. She says, we must hope the banks become less sick and less mad and realize that to save themselves, they must save everyone. Yeah, there are market fundamentalists who believe in their God, which is mammon. 
and they are the gatekeepers to the mammon. And they're saying that only we can allow for you to have access to God of money. Well, okay, so this woman says entrepreneurs, it has been said so many times over the past 30 years, create wealth. Right this minute, the foolish government is sitting around waiting with bated breath for glamorous entrepreneurs to get on with doing just that. So why are entrepreneurs being so shy, she goes on to say. So again, 30 years ago, as I said in the beginning, wages have been coming down. All of the productivity gains have been going to bankers. So what we've had, in fact, in the last 30 years is not waiting around for entrepreneurs. We've had uh, monopolies backed by the force of the government handing all of our wealth creation over to bankers. That's right. The entrepreneurs have been neutered. Yeah, exactly. So her saying, like, let's stop sitting around waiting for them and let's have the banks save us. The banks are the ones that killed us. They're the ones that destroyed us. And she doesn't know that to save ourselves, we need to save ourselves from the banks. Right. Well, this is why the banks have have around, surrounded themselves in this cloak of religious righteous behavior that they're doing God's work. They, they're trying to protect themselves by claiming divine right of kings. Or that This is how they're trying to escape the retribution. Well, so she's also saying that the, basically banks can, uh, only banks can create wealth because they can print money. Well, let's go back to America and look at this headline. Analysis, third time's a charm, whispers of QE3 emerge. Remember, so we're all being indoctrinated that only banks can create wealth. So this is Reuters asking, might the Federal Reserve extend its bond purchases beyond June? What until this week was a pie in the sky notion is suddenly fair game for market speculation. Oh, not on this show. We've been saying unequivocally that QE3 or the equivalent is coming, you know, as soon as QET ran out. And of course, they would let the market go through some kind of crash of some sort to frighten people into begging for the next QE and to totally annihilate their purchasing power. And this is the great thing about propaganda and the confidence tricks used by the Federal Reserve and Obama administration is that they get people to actually beg for their own imprisonment. That's the trick. We said this almost two years ago at QE1 that there would be QE2 and QE3 and QE4 and QE5. But they're acting in the mainstream media like that this was considered pie in the sky or uh, only in the fringe media is what they're saying. Because the wealth component in the U.S. is tied to consumption. You know, 70 percent of the GDP is consumption. People wage their wealth by how much they consume. They never take into consideration that 100 percent or I should say 500 percent of that consumption is driven by debt accumulation. It took $1 of debt to generate $1 of GDP 30 years ago. Then it got to 6 or $7 of debt to generate $1 of GDP just a few years ago. And then it hit the debt saturation point, and we've been having this colossal, total global screw-up ever since. And in response, the Federal Reserve has simply injected more fiat currency or debt into the system and is causing ultimately the final solution. People are just dying on the reservations and ghettos created by the Federal Reserve to get rid of this problem. Now the final two headlines here go to our great savior. Everybody says everything is going to be fine in China. Boy regrets selling his kidney to buy iPad. A 17-year-old student in Anhui province sold one of his kidneys for 20,000 yuan, which is about $3,000, only to buy an iPad 2. Now, with his health getting worse, the boy is feeling regret, but it is too late. Well, can Steve Jobs develop a dialysis app for the iPad to help the poor kid out? He sounds crazy, right, to sell his kidney for $3,000 to buy an iPad. But why does he need to sell his kidney? Because somebody else probably in America needs their kidney. And why do so many Americans need kidney transplants? Well, because to save themselves $3,000, they eat food. That's not, it's food-like substances that are processed foods that have no nutritional value that cause uh, the malnutrition that is obesity, and they, their kidneys end up exploding like ducks on a foie gras farm, and then they need to go buy something because, it, because they save themselves a few thousand there. They have to spend another few thousand to go have some guy rip his kidney out. Well, yes, this is the global economy, isn't it, where kidneys become a currency that are swapped <laughs> by the third world to people who make gadgets in the first world who are dying from kidney failure.
Well, Max, here's the final headline from China. China's slowdown starts with a spark. Now, remember the man who set himself on fire in Tunisia led to that uprising, which has spread throughout the Middle East. Where's the well, Facebook app for that? Well, here's Jin Libin, a resident of Inner Mongolia who ran a business empire encompassing supermarkets, mining, and transport. Well, he just set himself on fire one day in April and burned to death. The reason was because that he had millions of dollars, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loans. But because the government of China is cracking down on inflation, the article says that China is using financial tools to undermine inflation. And rather than merely allowing interest rates to rise, however, again, see, they're learning from the banking terrorists in America, the Bank of China has steadily tightened the major bank's reserve requirements, which now stand at 21 percent. That has effectively made credit more difficult to obtain without disturbing the nominal price of a loan. A consequence is that well-connected borrowers, primarily state-owned or state-controlled companies, still can get abundant cheap credit while players on the private market have an increasingly tough time. So this guy was paying huge interest payments every day because he was not politically connected, just like Goldman Sachs borrows from the Fed at 0.001%, while everybody else, even the semi-connected banks, borrow at 0.5%, and everybody else borrows at 30 Right, it's financial discrimination. So unless you're uh, connected, you know, you're going to be paying a lot for the money you borrow. And since the entire economy is drip, runs on borrowed money and there are no jobs, there are no manufacturing jobs, there's no way to even grow your own food or to have a job that sustains yourself and your family. You have to be in debt. And so the debt interest is determined by the kleptocrats and the oligarchs. It's Jim Crow laws apply to interest rates. Well, and like I said about the, the bankers on CNBC talking there that they were so baffled, it's the same thing going on in China. They're going to be, all these state-connected banker dudes are going to be baffled about all this spontaneous combustion going on. Who are all these people just spontaneously combusting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. they say, you know, back in the plantation days in America, the plantation owners be saying, we, why are them slaves so upset? Uh, we feed them, don't we? You know, well, what's the point of that? I mean, yeah, the slaves are upset because they don't want to be slaves. Duh. Okay, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Okay, and that's going to do it for this part of the show, but don't go away. Much more coming your way. Wild kings go mad, their people suffer. How some take advantage of power that was given to them. Secrets of big dirty money on RT. More than a month in one of the most extreme environments on the planet. This is Antarctica, and people have to be aware that they are far away from civilization. Sean Thomas discovers what makes Antarctica so special and attractive for many. The wildlife in Antarctica is both unique and fragile. Expedition to the bottom of the earth on RT. The close-up team has been to the Volgograd region, the venue of the turning point of World War II. This time, RT goes to the region where half of the area is occupied by a nature preserve, where the young generation treads in their ancestors' steps, and where the mysterious city of the dead lies. Welcome to the Republic of North Ossetia, the Russia close-up on RT. Hi, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. It, these Wall Street scamsters, they, they need more attention. What do you think, Stacey Herbert? Yes, Max. Wall Street, as we said, is so baffled by why the economy is collapsing that I thought I had to stay on and give you some more headlines to help them help themselves. I'm loving it! Well, first, uh, part of the reason why there's a death spiral of, in the economy of the United States, of course, is the price of gasoline. You know, that's soaring, and oil prices have been soaring. So let's look at this headline here, Max. Saudi Arabia plans to build 16 nuclear reactors by 2030. Now, the reason why I point this out is they're spending $100 billion to build 
16 nuclear power plants. That doesn't look good for those who believe that oil is endless. Well, remember, we made that film called Peaked about the whole peak oil phenomenon, and we actually went up to the Saudi border, and we talked to people on the ground in the region. They told us that Gawar, the big oil field in Saudi Arabia, like Bergen in Kuwait, like Cantarell in Mexico, is in rapid decline. So this is proof, in my opinion, that the Saudi oil reserves are plummeting. The country is madly scrambling to replace that energy capacity with these, with these reactors. And if anyone thinks that the supply of oil from this fracking operation going on in Texas now, you see that in Texas they found out that, oh, you know, all we have to do is do a little fracking by totally destroying the crust of the earth, which incidentally, in fill me in on the details. In another city, they were fracking and they caused an earthquake and they shut it down, right? That was in Blackpool, England. Yeah. Blackpool, England, they were doing the fracking. They go in there and they fracture the crust of the earth using hydraulic fracking fluid made out of 1,000% carcinogenic sludge, yeah. which they then dump into the water, which you then drink to help Oh, the energy companies. Saudi Arabia is obviously not going to be able to produce all that oil that their international energy agency says they're going to, and it all is going to be okay. Exclusive. Arcadia may have rigged Yemen oil exports cable. <laughs> so the cable is from the U.S. State Department, and it turns out that oil trading firm Arcadia Petroleum, sued by regulators just last week for allegedly manipulating U.S. oil prices, used hardball tactics in Yemen to buy the country's oil exports at below market prices until authorities revamped their sales process to break up the trading house's long-standing monopoly. So Arcadia was using a local agent who was a, a tribal leader named Hamid al-Armar. Now, these cables from the U.S. State Department say that once they had to compete with other competitors, then they didn't take it lightly. First, they started rigging the process where they were offering like a dollar more per barrel of, than the other competitors to drive them and scare them out of the market. But the State Department cables then cite a highly ranked government officials that says all Armar and Arcadia took their fear of competition further and scared away potentially more competitive bidders by threatening to kidnap their representatives. Well, that's, I think that falls under the category of best practices. <laughs> Somebody call KPMG. Get Booz Allen on the phone. That's right in their instruction manual. So they threatened uh, all kinds of murder and mayhem if they didn't get their way. Well, the point is, is that here are guys who are running our global markets, whether it's the high frequency traders or this guy just using old school thug tactics and, and, and sort of mafia tactics that run all of our price discovery mechanisms now. The classics, leg breaking, thumb flaying, skull fracturing. This is the stuff that price discovery is made out of. You know, and you mentioned Arcadia. My first thought, of course, was Philip Green's company, Arcadia. Yeah. In the UK, they own top shops, and they're being protested by UK Uncut for price-fixing market manipulation and not paying their taxes. So this group, uh, Arcadia name, seems to uh, in attract a lot of mal malfeasance. Well, actually, um, Philip Green, I saw, was in the news as well because he's advising David Cameron about how to make government more efficient. Government is run, of course, on taxpayer dollars. So a guy who pays no taxes <laughs> advising the government on how to spend his taxes is pretty, uh, it has a lot of chutzpah. Dave Cameron, you've gone to the right guy to get advice on how to run a government more efficiently, a guy who doesn't pay any taxes. <laughs> Good one. Like I said, we have the, the market makers around the world rigging the markets, the prices, and refusing, and, and well, basically using strong-arm tactics against any competitors. Here's another headline. Analyst, Goldman too big to face prosecution. Market mm -hmm. maker, Goldman Sachs, apparently won't face criminal prosecution related to sales of mortgage-linked securities because such a move could threaten the U.S. financial system, according to Brad Hintz, an analyst at Sanford C. Bernstein & Company. The U.S. Department of Justice, which is reviewing a Senate subcommittee report that alleged Goldman Sachs misled clients before the financial crisis, will avoid jeopardizing the fifth largest U.S. bank by assets because it's viewed as too big to fail. Yeah, well, here's a suicide banker that's got their hand on the pin. 
of the grenade that'll blow themselves up. That's Lloyd Blankfein. He says, if you come a step closer and investigate my financial terrorism, the whole place is going to blow. And that's their defense. They're saying, you can't investigate us because we're psychos. We're financial terrorists. They're like the boy in the dike. And I'm not talking about the East Village either. I'm talking about that story that came out of, you know, Netherlands. So here's a Wall Street guy again. These are the people who are baffled by the collapsing economy. So here's his, his quote, his letter it goes on to say, if an alleged violation is identified during a Goldman investigation, we expect a reasoned response from the Justice Department. A reasoned response is, in a worst case environment, we would expect a too big to fail bank such as Goldman to be offered a deferred prosecution agreement, pay a significant fine, and submit to a federal monitor in lieu of a criminal charge. This is what a reasoned response looks like. Here's Goldman Sachs. Okay, so you caught us. We make a market. How much are we going to cost the bribe? How much does it cost to pay you suckers off? You caught us. We broke the law, Goldman Sachs. It's not alleged. We committed fraud. How much are you going to take from us? How much is it going to cost us? We get it from the government anyway. We get the money from taxpayers. We print it up ourselves. We're freaking crooks. We steal all your money. And our stock is worth zero if it had any accountability whatsoever. But you're a freaking idiot for supporting terrorism. <laughs> Max. I haven't ripped up a 50 euro note. No, this will shock people. This will shock people. 50 Stop euros. It. I don't care. I just call Goldman and they rip up more. Stop I don't it. care. <laughs> I'll take it. Why don't you give it to me? Pull this out of my kidney. So, Max, again, this is what we're saying. People are baffled why the economy is collapsing. It's being taken by the too big to fails. They've run off with the economy, but they're too big to chase, too big to shoot down. Look, look, look speaking about too big to fail, there is, they made a movie version of that book. And they made, um, <clears throat> Hank uh, uh, Paulson was played by Bill Hurt. Okay, Bill Hurt, who I know, he hangs out in Paris a lot. And he told me personally, he was ashamed to do this movie. But nevertheless, yeah. the New York Times, uh, of course, gives a glossy spin on this movie. Sorkin, their, their little pimp writer. I think schmata. he wrote the book. Yeah, who wrote the book, who glorifies <laughs> these pimps. He himself is a stricken schmata for the New York Times. So they write this ridiculous treatise. Meanwhile, a, a movie like Inside Job that peels away the layers of the onion and a massive fraud. People are like... Oh, well, we don't know about that. Just, could it be possible? I don't know. You, don't, you shouldn't spread that one around. It's, it's too, it's, uh, I, can't, I can't take it. The, the truth is too much. Oh, that's fringe media, Max. Remember. The fringe media, only, the New only, York Times. Only the mainstream media tells you what you don't need to know. It's good for a hamster cage. It absorbs hamster really well. So, again, Max, we're helping Wall Street here. We've got to stay focused, okay? Next headline. Australia GDP falls most since 1991. Australia's economy shrank in the first quarter by the most in 20 years as floods hurt exports. Gross domestic product fell 1.2% from the previous three months. Exports slumped 8.7%, subtracting 2.1 percentage points from GDP growth. So massive floods, climate catastrophes all over the world. That You have floods in Australia. You have then the next headline, UN warns of food riots in developing world as drought pushes up prices. Uh -huh. So you see massive droughts in France. France is the biggest producer of wheat in, in Europe. Kansas is the biggest producer of wheat in America. They're being hit by extreme drought now. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you don't have anything well, to it's, say. It's, it's about due to climate change. And now everyone, every, there's a 10, you know, thousand sphincters just went <laughs> from people watching the show like, oh, Climate change? I better deny that. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as climate change. The, the evidence is stark, raving, mad, obvious in my face, but I can't possibly mention it because, heavens forbid, I might have to pay for my carbon excrement that I'm into the atmosphere. That's right, you sucker. You're going to have to pay one way or another. Even if you deny it, you're still going to have to pay. But also, it's going to be, because in America in particular, the mainstream media... And the fringe media won't report on those stories. So it's not just Wall Street that is baffled. It's the entire economy, the entire population is baffled about why, why is, why is, you know, they, they think it's speculators. Oh, the speculators destroyed my crops. 
in a way they did because of all the money printing, all the wild speculation that has driven people to sell their kidneys to buy iPads or consume processed food and, and consume and consume and consume and consume and consume and grow crazy. It also killed competition. It killed, yeah. This is what Paul Krugman, yeah, yeah, yeah. again, another New York Times salon monkey, doesn't understand. If you flood the money with Keynesian stimulus or monetary stimulus, you kill competition. You can't have a competitive capitalist society if the top 1% can just go down to the Fed and give us a trillion dollars for doing nothing and just say, oh, it's moral hazard as part of the system. You need competition in an academy, Paul Krugman, you freaking dishonest intellectual pygmy. Max, finally on this, everybody says, well, you know, um, if anything happens, if droughts and floods keep on wiping away crops and homes and societies, then uh, human ingenuity, those entrepreneurs that woman was talking about, will come save the day one day. So rainmakers of China struggling to cope with country's severe drought. So China's weather modifying program is straining to meet demand to alleviate the worst drought for more than 100 years. So here's China who spends more than any other nation on earth for weather modification to try to you know, put water where it's... Yeah, how about the, the fortune cookie modification system? So every single fortune cookie in China is open. You crack it open, it says you're a putz. You can't modify the weather, okay? What are you, arrogant Chinese what? people? What's, what's wrong with you? Well, it can add 10 to 15% more rainfall in an area that receives Yeah, in rainfall. one spot. It's yeah. called a well. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, this the drought in China is caused by twofold... Ch technologies and speculation because it's caused by the wild money printing and and wild speculative economies we created but it also is caused yeah. by the dams which have yeah. hoarded water you know to produce energy and and it also it diverts water away from the rivers yeah the d dams themselves are made with that really poor uh, quality chinese drywall <laughs> they're about to bust anyone living in the shadow of a dam you better learn how to swim that's just speculation Quick, speculation oh, God, i found out from the <laughs> somebody in china told me this is the truth it's made up all right, well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report. Thanks so much, Stacey, for the show. Well, Max, yeah. I hope our little lesson to Wall Street removes some of the bafflement from them. I hope, I hope some of the bafflement is indeed lifted. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert saying bye, y'all.